Bhavavatu Sahanao Bhunaktu Sahavirya Karavavahai Tejasvi Navadhi Tamastu Mavid Vishadahai Aum Shanti 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 Namaste. So, as usual, I've been studying and contemplating what I've studied and seeing how it applies to my experience in spiritual life. And what I've noticed is that as we move in time from the Vedic period to the post-Vedic period, the Puranic era, and finally the Tantric period, which we're in now, that the uh, practices, the meditations and the worship gets farther and farther away from Brahman. Let me illustrate this. Back in the Vedic period, what you had was basically shamanism. It was original and direct worship of Brahman by means of fire jagna, a direct offering to Brahman's mouth in the form of the sacred fire, and the use of the soma. Unfortunately, this has been lost and it's irrecoverable. The formula of the Soma is gone. Nobody can pronounce the Vedic mantras or even memorize them properly these days, and so on. Then in the post-Vedic period, you had a basically a contemplation type practice. And this is the first level of superimposition, abstraction or indirection, where the attention is not on Brahman directly, but indirectly through upasana, or meditation on Brahman through nature, or symbols. The elements of nature become symbols that lead you to Brahman eventually. Now this practice is recoverable because we have sufficient information. Then there's the Puranic era, where the practice is basically visualization. Now this is two levels of superimposition, abstraction or indirection away from Brahman. And this type of meditation is called Vidya, mental worship of Brahman through a deity form, which is visualized in the mind. This practice is also recoverable and many advanced devotees today actually perform this practice. It's just not well known. Then there's the Tantric era for about the last two or three hundred years, which is basically religion. Um, but this is three levels of superimposition, abstraction or indirection away from Brahman. And the practice in these days is puja, worship of Brahman in a physical deity or mantra form in the temple, either by uh, Abhishek or uh, Yantra or mantra like Kirtan and like that. And this is the current practice in most spiritual lineages today. This practice is basically religion. It's churchy. It requires a big building. And you have to go there. And then there's a leader, somebody who organizes everything and tells everybody what to do. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we see 
especially in Christianity, but even now in Buddhism, this kind of worship, this temple worship, becoming predominant. And the type of organizations, very much uh, top-down hierarchical organizations that build up around them. And we see it in India, too, in the various uh, sects of worship around the different deities. They seem to have forgotten the ultimate aim is Brahman. And I would submit the results of my analysis that the closer that a particular path or practice or lineage is to the original direct worship of Brahman, the longer lasting, more durable, and more potent that lineage is. There are plenty of examples of lineages that started out with a charismatic and powerful founder and then because they were not based on the original forms of worship, because they were not revealing Brahman directly, and they were not using the Vedic scriptures as a backup in case of any interruption or dilution of the original practice, these fell apart pretty quickly. They tend to de degenerate into ordinary religions, personality cults, and once they do degenerate into a personality cult, there's no way to get it back to the original because the reference point of the Vedic scriptures has been lost. A good case in point is Ramana Maharshi's. There's no doubt Ramana Maharshi was highly enlightened, maybe ultimately enlightened. But now, two generations after he disappeared, after he passed away, his organization has degenerated into a personality cult. And because there was no strong basis in the Vedic literatures, especially the Vedanta and Upanishads, there's no way to correct it. There's no reference point by which it could be reset or by which its original state could be recovered. So this is the point. And then we see others like the uh, lineage of the Shankaracharyas. Shankaracharya, of course, was the one who codified Vedanta by his brilliant, commentaries on Vedanta Sutra and Upanishads. His lineage is still going strong and is the most influential lineage in India today. And it shows no signs of deterioration. The current Shankaracharyas are all self-realized. I don't know of any other lineage that is so strong except maybe the Ramakrishna order. But it's hard to tell because they're so secretive and cultish. So this is the point. If things start to go wrong in a religious order, in a spiritual lineage, the only way to reset it back is to go to the original authority and if the original authority is simply a human being, enlightened or not, or whatever, once he passes away, everything goes downhill fast. So we see the lineages that don't suffer from these problems are very firmly based on Veda's literatures and that li these literatures are the basis for the whole thing. And if any problems arise, the literatures are the final authority, not any human intelligence. And this is because, I'll assert it once again, and always and often, the origin of the Vedas 
is superhuman, divine, transcendental. The Vedas were revealed to Lord Brahma at the beginning of the creation, and they've been passed down ever since from guru to disciple. And although their form may have changed, for example, they're no longer uh, simply an oral tradition. They were written down by Vyasadeva about 5,000 years ago. And maybe some of the rituals have changed and like that. Maybe there's more levels of indirection or superimposition between us and Brahman in the current scene or situation. Still, as long as the Vedic scriptures are regarded as the principal source of potency in a lineage, the lineage stays strong and does not degenerate. I mean, look at what happened to Buddhism. As soon as they cut themselves off from the Vedic culture and the Vedic literatures, boom, they went downhill fast. And now it's just another church. Just instead of Jesus on the altar, it's Buddha. Or instead of Krishna on the altar, <laughs> it's Buddha or somebody else. It's become a personality cult. And so the, the young monks today don't meditate. They don't follow the Vinaya and so on and so forth. It's degenerating. And what to speak of, you know, small uh, organizations based on someone who became self-realized and never did make much appeal or never did uh, use the Vedic literatures as a strong base or standard. Those are going to be swept away by time very quickly. So now that we've gotten a few minutes into the video, uh, I can talk more about my personal insights. I mentioned a couple of days ago that I got a vision in which my life purpose and so on was made very clear. And so I'm going to give some more details on that. Because of what I just explained, the best use of my remaining time and energy in this world is to support and further the organizations that are firmly based on the original Vedic and Vedantic literatures. So that means I'm going to be returning to India and I've got uh, an invitation from the Shankaracharya to uh, visit the Shankarapitas. And so I'm going on pilgrimage and I'm going to try to visit all four Shankarapitas and uh, see what happens, see who I meet, see what purposes or what opportunities reveal themselves. Because astrologically, this is a great opportunity for uh, people with Pisces rising like I have. And also, uh, although Sri Lanka is nice and I have good friends here, uh, it's not going to be my uh, home base. It's going to be kind of a backup place where I go to renew visas and so on. Um, because India is headed for a time of unparalleled prosperity. The next 20 or 30 years are going to be India's time to shine in the world situation. And unfortunately, it looks like America, Europe, Russia, and China are all headed for major conflicts, economic problems, and social collapse. And I've included a couple of links in the video description below. Uh, you can check out some of these ideas and uh, predictions. So I'll be returning to India soon. Not sure if I'm going to continue making videos just yet until I uh, decide what my next move is going to be. So, Aung Tatsat, Aung Shakti Aung.